Welcome everybody, I'm Ed Lengel. I'm Senior Director of Programs at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, and I'm delighted to be able to host this program, which is a great pleasure for me because I'm also a historian of the First World War, and I've, uh, I've written some on that war on the Western Front, although I'm particularly interested in the Eastern Front as well. And I think that uh, many of us who are students of the Second World War would benefit quite a bit to learn more about the First World War as setting the stage and being foundational really in so many ways for what happened in World War II. And my guest today is Dr. Alexander Watson of Goldsmiths University of London, who is a graduate of the Un University of Oxford. Uh, he is the author of a number of books uh, previously, Ring of Steel, Germany and Austria-Hungary at War 1914 to 1918. I know many of our guests are familiar with that fantastic book, which has won several writing awards. Uh, but he is here with us today to speak about The Fortress, uh, which I think is one of the best books that I've ever read on the First World War. It is really a first-rate book, very innovative, very insightful, and uh, I look forward to your presentation today. Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very, very much for having me. And um, thank you to you, Ed. Thank you to the World War II National, uh, the National World War II Museum. And also, though I can't see you, thank you to all of those listeners out there. I'm, I'm really grateful to you for coming and hearing, to, uh, hearing what I have to say. I'm going to share my screen with you um, because the Eastern Front is always best explained with pictures. The site of my webinar is The Fortress, The Great Siege of Przemysl and I wanted to begin with a map of Europe at the dawn of the 20th century. Um, a map of a peaceful continent which would, over the next 50 years, rip itself apart. And in the wars, revolutions, ethnic cleansings, genocides that were to be perpetrated on that continent in those 50 bloody years, the most affected region was East Central Europe on the right of the screen region which historians have recently come to be called the bloodlands. Now the most notorious crimes perpetrated in this region were committed by the regimes of Stalin and Hitler in the 1930s and 1940s and those two totalitarian regimes together in those decades murdered 14 million people. And historians have investigated those crimes very, very thoroughly. They've explored the regimes, they've examined their ideologies, they've scrutinized the population re-engineering programs that each of them had. And most recently, they've turned to looking not simply at their capitals at Moscow and Berlin, but also at how those totalitarian projects interlocked in the 1940s in order to produce this wave of extraordinary bloodshed. What mostly historians of the Second World War and of the totalitarian regimes haven't done though is cast further back. And what I want to do in my webinar today is explore the prehistory to that bloodshed. Because of course, the totalitarian projects, the projects of Hitler and Stalin executed in the 1940s, weren't the first violence that this region had seen. In fact, even before Hitler and Stalin, decades before, East Central Europe had seen huge armies rage across it. It had seen bloody, bloody fighting, and it had also seen frighteningly modern programs of ethnic reorganization, of ethnic cleansing. And my core argument today is that if we're going to understand East Central Europe's extraordinarily bloody 20th century, if we want to understand why it was this region, very multi-ethnic region, that lay at the center of the bloodshed through the first half of the 20th century, 
then actually it's not enough to start with the beginning of the Second World War in 1939 or with the uh, rise of the dictators, Stalin in 1928 and Hitler in 1933. It's not even enough to begin with the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the subsequent bloody counter-revolutions that followed. If we want to understand why East Central Europe suffered so much, if we want to comprehend that ordeal, then we've got to go right back to 1914. We've got to go back to the outbreak of the First World War. 1914, this is my core argument, is East Central Europe's year zero. This is where the horror begins. What I'm showing on the map is the situation in, in, in 1914 on the Eastern Front. There was a huge imperial clash. Three major empires, Germany in the Northwest, Austria-Hungary in the Southeast, and sorry, in the Southwest and, and, and Russia in the East. And it's the Russian Empire that in some ways is the most interesting. Russia is on the offensive on the Eastern Front in 1914. Germany adopts a defensive stance. Austria-Hungary attempts an offensive which fails and quickly switches to the, to, to the de defensive. So it's, it's, it's Russia that is attacking. And more than that, Russia has clear goals of conquest in this region. The center uh, the focus of the Russian military leaderships and imperial leaderships ambitions is Galicia. And Galicia was the northeastern province of Austria-Hungary. So it's roughly the area which lies just to the, to, to the northeast of that line demarcating East Central Europe. It's the, it's the blue area with the black and yellow Habsburg flag in it. And the Russian leadership wanted Galicia, it wanted to take over Galicia, particularly wanted Eastern Galicia, which it argued was primordial Russian land. There were in fact very few Russians living there, arguably none. There were around, the population was around 8 million, about 4 million of them were um, of Polish ethnicity, 4 million were Ukrainian speakers, some of whom identified as Russians, and there were also around 800,000 Jews. But nonetheless, it was this land that Russian leaders perceived to be their own. And what we find during the First World War is that when it becomes clear that this is not their own, they're willing to execute and begin programs of ethnic cleansing and reorganization to turn it into, in the Tsar's words, a great Russia to the Carpathians, great Russia to the Carpathian mountains. I'm particularly going to focus on one fortress city, the city of Przemysl. This city is today in the southeastern corner of Poland. It's just inside the Polish-Ukrainian border. In 1914, it was a Habsburg city. It was like the rest of the region, ethnically diverse. Around half the population were Poles, around 20% were Ukrainians, around 30% were Jews. And Przemysl was, uh, Przemysl is important for two reasons. First, it plays a big role in at the start of the First World War. It's a fortress city and it plays a decisive role in the beginning of the fighting. The second reason is that it's on Przemysl that the violence and the ethnic cleansing that the Russian army was prepared to perpetrate to win over and change this region, it's where these two phenomena find their greatest intensity. It's where they converge. So I find it useful to think of Przemysl as, as a weather vane for the harsh winds of the 20th century. Przemysl tells us something about the trend that the 20th century was on, the track that Europe was placed on by 1914. And it shows us alarmingly how quickly the violence escalated. Showing a map here of, 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 of Galicia, so that, 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 that blue area of the Habsburg Empire, this is the northeasterly province of the Habsburg Empire, and you can see Przemysl underlined in red right in the middle of, uh, of the map. The Habsburg Empire built a fortress here from the 1870s, and it chose Przemysl for its main bastion in the east for three reasons. The first reason was that Przemysl was on the last high ground before the Russian, uh, before Russia, it was on the last high ground before the border. As you can see, Galicia was very difficult to defend. It was surrounded by Russia on two sides in the north and to the east. And Przemysl was very, very defensible. In the 1870s, when it was chosen as the site of the fortress, the Austro-Hungarian army, Habsburg army, 
chose it because because the strategy was to, to um, place a large body of troops there and be prepared to react to a Russian attack from whichever side it came. So it turned the centrality of, of, of Shemish as well as its defensibility into, an, into a strategic advantage. The second reason why Shemish was uh, chosen as a, the site of a fortress was that it stood in front of the main passes over the Carpathian Mountains to Habsburg Hungary. Now Habsburg Hungary is marked in yellow on this map, the province of Galicia is marked in, in, in pink, and the Galician, uh, sorry, in the Carpathian Mountains, you can see shaded in on the border between that pink and the yellow. Huge mountain range uh, stretching across East Central Europe. The third reason, and the most important one why Przemysl was chosen, was that it was a transport node. Um, the main railway and road links crossing east-west, and you can see these, these are brown lines on the map, passed through Przemysl. And also Przemysl controlled the main railway to south, down south into Hungary as well. So any Russian invader wishing to uh, break into Central Europe would need to capture Przemysl in order to advance. It needed to take those crucial railway and road links, and Przemysl blocked that. Without Przemysl, there could be no advance to Vienna or to Budapest, to Vienna in Austria or to Budapest in Hungary. So that was why Przemysl was chosen, and that was why it was so crucial. And by 1914, the city had a defensive ring, 30 miles in circumference, built around it, with 35 forts on it. As you can see from this map, there were in fact two defensive rings, a very weak inner one, but the one I'm talking about is the outer one with the forts marked in red or green on it. The city itself was important too. I've already said it was like the rest of Galicia, multicultural with Poles, Ukrainian speakers, Jews. Um, it was actually the third largest city in the province after Krakow, which um, Krakow is sometimes pronounced, which uh, many of you may have heard of, and also Lemberg, which also goes by the name of Lvov and today Lviv. Um, so Przemysl was the third largest with 56,000 people in it. And it was, it was typical of the, uh, of, of the region's diversity linguistic and religious diversity. It was, if you, play, if you like, as the, whole, as the whole region was, but Przemysl was at the centre of it. It was a crossroad of cultures. This was where East met West. It was where the Roman Catholic Church met the Greek Catholic Church. There were two bishops in the province. It was where the language borders blur, blurred and mixed. And Przemysl is important to us because in 1914, already at the outbreak of the First World War, it plays a decisive role in shaping the course of that war, indeed in shaping the whole of European history. The war broke out in the East on the 6th of August, 1914. That was when the Austria-Hungary, when Austria -Hungary, Habsburg Empire, when it went to war with Russia. And it was an extraordinary shock for inhabitants. It was an extraordinary shock for three reasons. The first was that for decades, the Habsburg Empire had been a pretty peaceable place. War had become fairly unimaginable. For sure, the storm clouds had gathered, people could see that there was, uh, there, there was great power conflict. But as, as in our own age, the idea that there could be, um, that this could actually break out into a hot conflict, um, rather than simply sparring, cold wars, um, arms races, to most people, that, that seems simply unimaginable. And yet it happened. The second reason why the war is such a huge shock is that it goes so hugely badly for the Habsburg Empire. The Habsburg Empire intends to fight in the, in the east, but it's got an army which is much smaller than the Russians. It's got a, an army which is much less well-trained and certainly far less well-led than the Russians. And in the first month of the war, it is annihilated in Eastern Galicia. To give you some idea of how intense this fighting is, it's, it, it's really fighting to match any of the horror seen on the, in the more famous battles on the Western Front or even on the Eastern Front in the Second World War. In the first month of the war, um, the Austro-Hungarian army loses a third of its effectives. It starts the war with 900,000 combat troops in uh, uh, deploying them to Galicia. By mid-September, 350,000 of those men either lie dead on the battlefields of eastern Galicia, or they've been wounded, or they've been captured. Just simply extraordinary. And the Russian army bats the Austro-Hungarians back. 
On the 11th of September, a general retreat is called, which passes through Przemysl heading westwards rapidly. And all this time, the army is collapsing. Um, it hasn't just simply taken horrendous casualties, it's also lost half its officers, but its, it, its discipline is fraying. Um, there's desertions, there are attacks on the population. Perhaps the army ceases in this period, already in the first month of the war, to be a viable fighting force. And the Russians come after. And for a few brief but critical weeks in the autumn of 1914, the fortress city of Przemysla and its garrison of 130,000 middle-aged soldiers, roughly my age, I'm 41, um, the oldest soldiers there, most soldiers there were between 37 and 42, um, were the only viable force the Habsburgs had standing against the Russians. Their military training was a decade in the past. The officers were actually in many ways, frighteningly, rather people like like, like me and Ed here. They were um, businessmen, civil servants, and I'm afraid to say academics, exactly the sorts of people that you would under no circumstance want taking control in an emergency situation when the very existence of an imperial state is, is, is in question. So the war is shocking simply because it breaks out, but also because it goes so horrendously badly. The garrison and citizens of Przemysl, the last thing they're expecting is to end up as the only thing standing in front of a Russian invasion of Central Europe. The third reason why this is shocking is because of what the Russians do as they advance. As they march towards Pshemish, they blaze quite literally a trail. If you imagine a gunpowder, a line of gunpowder sort of sparked off with blazes approaching city, that's, that's kind of how it is. Uh, the Polish um, committee, um, it's almost like an NGO from 1914, um, for, uh, representing the impacts of Poles reported on the Russian invasion of Galicia. And it said this about it. It said that the Russians announced themselves as liberators of the Slavic peoples from the German yoke. And then they marched in. They were like a vast, filthy tidal wave blown over the land by a heavy wind. And they swept away everything that was in their path. Affluence and order, peace and civilization. Their way was marked by destruction and despoilment, arson and rape. The people to suffer most were the Jews of uh, Eastern Galicia. As I said, there were around 800,000 uh, Jews living in the province, and one in ten of the population. And the Russian army was violently anti-Semitic, and especially certain regiments of it, the light cavalry, the Cossacks. And what we find is um, huge amounts of looting, uh, rape, um, theft and, uh, and, and bodily harm, and also some murder. At this point, it's mostly indiscipline and looting and humiliation rather than actual killing. Um, but it's, uh, it causes a lot of both property destruction and it ruins people's livelihoods. And especially, as I've said, and this is important, if we think about the future of this region, violent anti-Semitism is already present in 1914 in the region. When the Nazis come in 30 years later, this is not by any means a tabula rasa. This is not a this is not a, a, a region that has only ever experienced peace. Astoundingly, the fortress withstands and, and its old garrison withstands the Russians. In October, there's an epic battle from the 5th to the 7th, uh, where the Russians, having encircled the fortress uh, in the second half of September, attempt to storm it, and they fail to break the garrison. And the block that the, the, the fortress provides and the resistance that it carries out successfully provides just enough time for the Habsburg army, 80 miles away to the west, to regroup, refill its ranks, restore discipline, and then come forward. So Przemysl plays a really important role in that early part of the war in just giving that crucial breathing space to stop a, hope, to stop a total military collapse and allow the Habsburg army to, to recuperate and return to the battle. The success doesn't last long, however. The success is important, not just saving the Habsburg Empire, but uh, not just saving the Habsburg em Empire, but also because it provides Przemysl with immense prestige. This is a place which very few people can pronounce and even fewer have heard of in 1914, but it becomes a name 
spluttered, let's say, on everybody's lips right across the empire. Because the Habsburg Empire is really short of victories in October 1914, and Przemysl provides one. It, in prestige terms, the, the best equivalent that I can give you is, is for the Habsburg Empire, Przemysl performs what, what Stalingrad does for the Soviet Union in the Second World War. It becomes a symbol of the entire Habsburg war effort, a symbol of Habsburg determination to see this bitter fight right through to the end. The Russians return in November 1914. The, the, the war continues to go badly for the Habsburg army and um, the Habsburg army at the start of November is forced to retreat uh, both south into the Carpathian Mountains. You can see the rough line that the, uh, that the uh, Habsburg army adopted in November. Um, down to the south and also about nearly 100 miles west um, to the outskirts of Krakow. And Przemysl is left uh, again on its own besieged encircled by the Russians. Then Przemysl's siege is the longest of the First World War from September because the Russians never leave the, uh, uh, the eastern side of it, right through until March 1915. For 181 days, Przemysl's garrison is in action. That's how long the siege lasts. It's longer than the Battle of Stalingrad. It's not as long by, by quite a way as the, as the Battle of Leningrad, the Siege of Leningrad in the Second World War. But for the First World War, no other city goes through an ordeal like this. And we see in this siege, especially the second siege, the beginnings of total war. That's not surprising. If you think about what historians understand by total war, what was understood by total war um, towards the end and in the immediate aftermath of the First World War when the term was coined. Total war is about blockade. If we imagine 20th century total war, then a large part of that is about the mobilization of economic resources um, to the fullest extent possible for the war effort and the blockade by the enemy of those resources. And we see that, of course, in siege warfare from time immemorial. So one of the ways that I think Przemysl can, can enlighten us about 20th century total war is, is to think of it as, as an older form of war, siege war, which through modern 20th century technology is writ large on a scale never ever seen before, encompassing not just cities, but entire continents. But it starts in Przemysl. Przemysl is an early example of this because it's a siege. Um, and we, we, we see things, we see, we see manifestations that, that are very prominent uh, later in the war across Central Europe in 1917 and 18, and then in the Second World War as well. We see wild improvisation in 1914 when the siege begins. The, uh, the city and, and, and garrison um, puts a lot of resources and time into desperately trying to make winter clothing because troops are still in their summer uniforms and there's been no opportunity, or at least the Habsburg army has failed, it's better, maybe better to say, to re-equip them with the warm winter clothing that they will need to survive a harsh East Central European winter. Um, they make weapons as well, just like at, at Leningrad, weapons are improvised, um, drain pipes are turned into mortars. Um, the garrison even makes an armoured train by, by uh, riveting huge, thick bits of steel to, uh, um, to, to a civilian locomotive. So you get that improvisation. But above all, the major, uh, the major phenomenon of total war that, that we see in 1917 and 18 across the continent, and again in parts of Central Europe in the Second World War, is hunger. Strategies of starvation are, are, are used already in 1914. We see that actually writ large, uh, that the British um, open their naval blockade of Germany and Austria-Hungary already in November 1914. But the Russians use strategies of starvation on a smaller scale to, uh, to bring down Przemysl as well. Already in November 1914, at the start of the second siege, there's huge inflation. Um, Potatoes uh, cost 15 times the peacetime price. Bread rises to 40 times what it costs in uh, what it costs in in, in the pre-war period for civilians. And then both potatoes and bread runs out. And in 1915, both civilians and the garrison are reduced to eating army horses in order to survive. There are 21,000 horses in uh, in in the in, in the fortress, and all but 4,000 of them are, are eaten. That's, that's what the garrison and um, city subsist on. I think it's worth pausing a moment there and, 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 and uh, just thinking about what that means. Because of course, in war, we generally focus not unreasonably on, on human suffering. 
And Pierre Michelet in 1915 was an extraordinarily dangerous place to be as a human, but it was an even more totally dangerous place to be as a horse. Pretty much the entire horse complement of the fortress dies, either eaten before the end or killed just before the capitulation. Civilian mortality in the fortress doubles during the siege, um, and uh, for, the, uh, for, for the garrison too, there is malnutrition and even starvation. We have reports at the time which describe how the men look very bad. This is a quotation. They have deeply sunken cheeks, bulging eyes, ears transparent like paper. They drag themselves laboriously forward. One sees their feebleness. This is, this is extraordinary suffering in, 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 in early 1915. And of course, this is, this, these are phenomena that we'll see again and again and again in the following decades in this region. Hunger, of course, starving out a city was a strategy as old as siege warfare itself. It, it is a phenomenon of 20th century total war, but it's also a phenomenon of siege warfare since time immemorial. There were also, though, agonies and, and, and persecutions and violence which beset the civilians and garrison of Przemysl, uh, which were very distinctively 20th century. The citizens of Przemysl were one of the very first urban populations in history to suffer aerial bombardment. The Russians during the siege bombed the city and its surrounding fortifications. Around 275 bombs are dropped uh, through 1914, 1915 on the city. Uh, these do minimal damage. The, the, the casualties amount to 10 people killed and perhaps double that number wounded. But what's What's interesting, I think, and you can kind of see this from the picture, from the shock in these people's faces, even though the damage is, is almost comically little to this, to, the, to this hovel behind them, is that they glimpsed an apocalyptic future, a future that was, was, was to come, but, but not yet. Um, the, the idea, and you get this in diaries in Przemysl, that aerial armada could potentially destroy entire cities. Now, the roots are here, the execution, the technology isn't yet, but the roots, the ideas are already coming about in 1914 as this extraordinary violence breaks, breaks taboos and, 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 and encourages new ideas of bloodshed. The campaign around Przemysl as well is, is not in any way in terms of its horror any less than any of the better known battles on the Western Front of Verdun, of some, nor indeed of any of the, 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 the great and horrific battles on the Eastern Front in the Second World War, Leningrad, Stalingrad. Because Przemysl is so prestigious, because it's a symbol of the Habsburg Empire's will to hold on, the Habsburg army has to relieve it at all costs. But the Habsburg army is, 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 is miles and miles away. And what its commanders decide to do is attempt to reach Przemysl, which you can just see in the distance appropriately on this, on, on this image, just underneath the aeroplane on the left. They try and reach it by the most direct way, which is over the Carpathian mountain range. Now, the Carpathian mountain range is around 100 kilometres in breadth. Sorry, 100, uh, yeah, about 100 kilometres in breadth. So that's, uh, oh, I don't know, um, 40 miles, something like that in breadth. And uh, it's the, the highest peaks are six and a half thousand foot. What Habsburg troops were told to do was break through this mountain range in the middle of winter, fighting at heights usually of around two and a half thousand foot in temperatures of minus four degrees Fahrenheit. It was extraordinary. I find it difficult to imagine that any army in any war ever has, has met conditions which could be worse than what the Habsburgs and the Russians faced in that bitter, bitter offensive from January to March 1915. Um, supply was virtually impossible, or at least certainly extraordinarily difficult. Um, there weren't enough railways in order to bring the supplies of food, of munitions that the troops needed. And then, of course, at the railheads, these supplies had to be taken up cliff faces, steep, winding mountain roads, all in, all in midwinter, all with snow and ice. Two thirds of casualties are, are caused by frostbite. Men have to warm their weapons before they're able to fire them. Um, and the casualties combined of both the Russians and the Habsburgs are something like 1.2 million, maybe more, just in those three months. 
just extraordinary. It's difficult to put that in any sort of context. That's more, that's way more than Verdun. It's roughly the same as the Somme, which in 1916, which took place over a larger period. Um, it's not so different either from Stalingrad. Just completely horrendous, both in terms of the, of the horror of the fight itself and the bloodletting that resulted. And worst of all, maybe, it was unsuccessful. Of course, the Habsburgs couldn't do it. There was no way they were able to break through this mountain range in midwinter. As well as the strategies of starvation and the extraordinary bloodletting, what we also see from the Russians and the Habsburgs and the fortress garrison are mentalities developing of absolute destruction. And the garrison itself embraces this in the last period of the war. In March 1915, it is clear that the garrison has been pushed, the troops have been pushed to their absolute limit. One in every five of the Habsburg soldiers defending Chemish in the middle of March 1950 is in hospital suffering from either malnutrition or starvation induced weakness. And those troops who are still standing are only just standing. Combat is, 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 is pretty much impossible for the majority of them. On top of that as well, food is running out. By mid-March, there's only by the fortress garrisons, uh, by the fortress command's calculations, a week and a half of very, very scant rations left for the garrison. And so the decision is made to capitulate. It's, it's realised that there is really no other option. But the command is determined to leave nothing of any military value to the Russians whatsoever. And on the night of the 21st, 22nd of March, at around 10 p.m., the Habsburg guns, the Habsburg fortresses guns, all of the guns, opened up and they launched this horrendous bombardment, which lasted all night, firing off their ammunition. And then, at 6 a.m. in the morning, there was a flare from the north of the fortress perimeter, followed by a loud detonation, and then another, and then another, and then another. Witnesses uh, in the city and, in, in, uh, and, and behind the front lines described it as being as if a series, of, a series of volcanoes, a ring of volcanoes, had erupted one after another all around the city. And that was the forts going up. In addition, within the city itself, there were also major explosions which shattered windows and caused plaster to come down from walls and powder magazines were blown up. And the three bridges which spanned the river, the River San, which ran through Przemysl, um, and which were crucial for the life of the city, they linked the north of the city to the south of the city. Um, they were collapsed, they were, they were blown up and demolished as well. And then the Russians marched in. And what we find in March 1915 is, uh, is, is already from that point, a program of um, ethnic reorganization. The Tsar said, I've already mentioned this earlier, that there is no Galicia. There is only a great Russia to the Carpathians. And what he meant by that was not simply that the province of Galicia shouldn't exist, but that the multi-ethnic entity of Galicia should not exist either. This was Russian land from time immemorial in the Tsar's rather warped mind. The Russians had begun their program of ethnic reorganization very, very early on. Um, Polish elites had managed the province before the war and these were arrested and removed from power wherever the Russian army entered already in 1914. Ukrainians too were arrested and we find this in Przemysl and in other areas. Um, the term Ukrainian, the word Ukrainian is actually banned. You're not allowed to use that because it's perceived as a political term, denoting adherence to a Ukrainian nation that the Russians refused, and still today in some cases refuse to acknowledge the existence of. The Russians prefer to use the term for Ukrainian speakers Little Russians, they see them as a branch of the, uh, of the Russian population, and that's a term that President Putin has also used in past years to, um, to describe Ukrainians as well in our own era. Um, and there are programs of forcible religious conversion, which aren't entirely, it should be said, sanctioned by the, um, 
by the military high command. There's, the, there's disputes about that with the Russian Orthodox Church, but for Russian leaders, um, adherence to the Russian Orthodox religion is perceived to be the, um, the, the key sign of, of adherence to Russian nationality. So the Russian Orthodox begins a campaign of proletization very early. Um, there are also plans to change schooling as well. Ukrainian children who have been educated in Ukrainian uh, under the Habsburg Empire are no longer to be done so under the Russian occupation. Instead, the Russians intend to turn Ukrainian children very literally into little Russians. The only, uh, the only education that will be permitted will be Russian education, uh, Russian language education for Ukrainian speakers. Most startlingly is uh, what the Russians do with uh, the Jewish population of Galicia and also of Przemysl. And we see over the course of the invasion from September 1914 um, through to the summer of 1915, a radicalization going on. The first violence towards the Jews of Galicia, which as, as I've said is immediate, is largely indisciplined violence. It's tolerated, but it's not planned. But very quickly, uh, plans and programs develop to humiliate and persecute and ultimately remove Jews. The Russians perceive Jews, the Russian army in particular perceives Jews in a racial sense, having particular racial characteristics um, of uh, being unreliable, of being deceptive, of being materialistic, of being economic predators. And very early in 1915, uh, measures are taken to prepare for the expropriation of Jews' lands in Galicia. Um, various other economic attacks are made on the Jewish population. Hostages are taken disproportionately from the Jewish population and most tellingly and, and disturbingly for the later course of history of this region, deportations begin on a huge scale. The Imperial Russian army in the first three months of 1915 um, forcibly moves around 100,000 Galician Jews. 50,000 are moved around Eastern Galicia and another 50,000 are moved into Russia itself. All of this happens in Shemish too, and Shemish is, is, is where it reaches its greater intensity. We see from very early on the Polish elites being uh, replaced by um, pro-Russian uh, Ukrainian speakers who perceive themselves to be part of the Russian nation. Um, we see attacks on uh, Ukrainian religion and language. The Greek Catholic Ukrainian national uh, bishop of Przemysla is persecuted and harassed through the occupation, eventually dies of a, of a stroke. But most radically, we see um, the Russians persecuting uh, Przemysla's Jews, at first through humiliation, separation. Uh, Jews are separated, they are um, humiliated, forced to undertake menial tasks in ways that are very familiar, will be very familiar to any student of the Second World War. And ultimately, at the end of April 1915, the Russian military authorities decide to cleanse the city of all of the Jews, the city and the surrounding areas. And in April 1915, this poster in three languages, Russian, Polish and Yiddish, goes up and it says to the uh, to this executive Jewish committee, on the order of the uh, fortress commander of Przemysl, that's the Russian fortress commander, um, I inform you that all Jews in Przemysl and the, and, and the surrounding districts must leave uh, the surrounding district immediately. And it goes on to say that a committee, a Jewish committee, has been set up to do this. The Russians, like the Nazis later, the Nazis, of course, set up the infamous Judenrieter to uh, the Jewish councils to execute, to, to carry out their orders. The Russians also realized that the most effective way of, of, of getting Jewish populations to do things was to force their own leaders to order them to do so. So an executive committee has been up, has been set up, and the, the poster says that, um, in, informs the population that this committee will organize the evacuation. And that if Jews don't obey its orders, yeah, placing responsibility for the, for, for the deportation and removal on Jewish leaders, again a technique that we see 20 years later, um, then, um, uh, then, uh, the, for, then the, um, the, deep, the, the exiling, the, the removal will be carried out with the most energetic measures, a, a regiment of Cossacks, the most anti-Semitic uh, troops in the army, will carry out the evacuation in the course of a few hours. 
and the, the order ends ominously with uh, those who are disobedient will have only themselves to blame. And this actually happened. 17,000 Jews were forced out of Przemyśla and the surrounding district in early May 1915 and headed east, forced east, to a very, very uncertain future. Now to finish up, the Russians were never ultimately able to uh, complete their population re-engineering projects because in the summer of 1915, the Central Powers launched a big offensive. And on the 3rd of June 1915, German troops released Przemysl from Russian occupation. Yet although they ended the occupation, they didn't end Przemysl's, uh, they didn't end Przemysl's ordeal, which was to continue in following decades. The divisions that the war, that the siege had caused, particularly the hunger between ethnic groups within, uh, within Przemysl, which had, had generated a lot of anti-Semitism, persisted into the interwar period and the violence too simmered and spat right through the 20s and 30s when Przemysl became part of the Republic of Poland. And then in 1939, both the Germans in their new guise as the Soviets, as, as the Nazis, and the Russians in their new guise as the Soviets, marched in. And Przemysl, again, just in the First World War, played a significant role in the second because it was right on the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, the frontier that divided these two evil empires. Przemysl became one of the two major gateways on this uh, fortified border between the Nazi empire and the Soviet empire. So the south of the city experienced a Soviet occupation and the north experienced a Nazi occupation. And I think what's significant is that much about these occupations would not in any way have been new to anybody who had gone through the Imperial Russian occupation of 1915. The attacks on schooling and religion, which both the Soviets and the Nazis carried out, their divisive ethnopolitics, the arbitrary violence of both regimes, the looting, the corruption, these were all things that, that, that the citizens, Jews and Gentiles, had seen in 1915. It wasn't in any way new. And this, I think, is something the historians don't acknowledge or recognise, but it wasn't. More than that, these regimes had taken stuff. They'd learned something from the experiences of the past. The Soviet regime had learned directly from the Imperial Army the, the, the utility of deportations. I've already talked about how the Imperial Russian Army deported 100,000 Jews in Galicia, and it deported many more within the Russian borders itself as well during the Great Retreat of 1915. The Soviets take up those techniques, they learn from those techniques, and they deport people on an extraordinary scale in the Second World War. In imperial, po sorry, in, in occupied interwar Poland itself, in the Soviet sector, some 750,000 people are deported by the Soviets. In many ways, though, it's the Nazis that are the more direct successors uh, in this region to the Imperial Russian army. And that's not because they share personnel or even that they were directly influenced. Rather, what they have is shared ideas with the Imperial Russian army. Um, what we find in, with both regimes, the Imperial Russian occupation and the Nazi occupation 20 years later, is uh, extreme racial anti-Semitism, albeit more rigidly biological in the Nazi case. We see extreme nationalism, we see military ruthlessness, and we see in these two regimes a shared logic, um, a shared attitude, uh, and a shared logic uh, towards this particular multi-ethnic area of Europe as a region of experimentation, a region of brutal possibilities for population re-engineering. So, I would argue that when the Nazis and the Soviets came in in 1939, and then of course the Nazis took over the rest of the city in 1941, the major difference is one of totality. These projects aren't so much new as more extreme and more total than what has gone on before. The Nazis and the communists together completed a, a regime of violence that had begun in 1914. The Nazis destroyed 
Przemyślers and the wider region's Jewish population. By the end of the Second World War, just 450 of a population of 20,000 uh, Jews in 1939 survived the Holocaust. And a satellite Polish communist government exiled all Ukrainians from the city in the immediate aftermath of the First World War to create a purely Polish city and ultimately bring a horrific end to a stream of violence that had begun and never really stopped, but simply changed, developed and mutated already in 1914. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm really interested in what questions you've got. Thank you, Alex. Fascinating is not surprising to me because the book is fascinating. We have quite a few questions flowing in, which is wonderful. I'm going to start by uh, building off a question from Michael S. Goodman, who wants to know why First World War on the Eastern Front has been so neglected. And I remember when I started studying World War I 30 years ago. I think the first I read on the Eastern Front was Winston Churchill's history of the war on the Eastern Front. And then, of course, Norman Stone uh, was a great historian of the Eastern Front. Uh, there's been somewhat more lately, and I'll build upon that to ask you, in your previous work on Germany and Austria-Hungary, what drew you to this topic? Honestly, my wife is Polish. Um, that's 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 where it began. I mean, I, I, I started. So my first book was was about um, I've always been interested in the First World War, I think, because uh, the First World War and, and, and the horror of it, especially on the Western Front, is such an important part of British national identity. I grew up hearing about stories of the, the trenches and the bloodshed on the Somme and, 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 and the horror of the Western Front. And my, my doctorate I did on, on the Western Front and I did a I did a comparative study of, of the British and the German armies. I was asking why why people, why, uh, how people endured that, how these soldiers on both sides endured that. So I learned German for that. And then I began realizing as I got into, as I moved away from, from my own sort of stereotypes that I'd grown up with, that actually the further east you go, the worse things get. And that though the war was awful for the British, it was even worse for the Germans. And then I met my wife and, um, and I learned Polish and I began realizing that if you go even further east, it gets even more awful, but also, even more interesting as well in, a, in an academic sense. It's not a period I would want to live through in any way. Um, but um, that, was, that was my own personal interest. In terms of why it was so neglected, I think there are two reasons for that. One is the languages. Uh, if you want to study the Habsburg Empire, the Habsburg Empire had 11 official languages. Uh, mm. German and Hungarian are the most important. Polish was the language of administration in Galicia. Uh, so, so this is one obstacle. And of course, then of course, there's Russian on the other side as well. So the language is one obstacle. The second issue is um, the politics, uh, because for a long time, under the communist regimes, which persisted until 19, 1989, 1990, um, firstly, the First World War wasn't an issue of interest. The Russian history, modern history started in 1917 with the Russian Revolution for these regimes. And then if you were going to study a war, it was the Great Patriotic War where the Soviets saved uh, the rest of the saved the rest of the world. So there wasn't any interest in the in the ideology at the time of uh, or of the First World War. At best, it was a precursor to the Russian Revolution. Nothing more than that. Um, uh, and more than that, of course, I, I guess, uh, well, more than that, um, in popular memory, because the bloodshed of the 30s and 40s was so horrendous, in popular memory, it subsumed everything else. Um, it, it, it subsumed the memory of the, you know, it was, it was a lesser violence. It pointed the way towards, but it was a lesser violence of the First World War um, and pointed the way towards a much, uh, uh, and, and it, was, it was that greater violence of the Nazis and Soviets that people remembered. Thank you. So we've got a, a great uh, comment question here from Philip Ross. He says, I've read your book and it is excellent. And I agree. Uh, my great uncle was a 38 year old Jewish tinsmith who was drafted into the Hungarian army and was a defender during the siege of Chemisha. And he was captured by Russia when the fortress surrendered and was a prisoner of war in Siberia until 1918, when he returned to Hungary via Vladivostok. Are there any books you can recommend for further reading regarding the experience of captured Austro-Hungarian soldiers held in Siberia? And of course, that's a, that's a big topic right there and a very interesting one. So in English, the best is, um, uh, the best book is, is um, a book uh, by Aris, though at the time uh, the name was Alan Rachmaninov. Um, 
uh, if you take a look at uh, the, if you've got my book, then if you take a look at the bibliography, uh, that's uh, it's it's in the bibliography. That's the best book in English. There's also a lot in German by a historian called Georg Wurzer. Um, and there's another German historian called uh, Nachtigall, I think Reinhard Nachtigall, who writes about it. So I, I'd recommend all three of those. But if you read English, then um, Rachmaninoff is the, is, 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 is the place to start. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Paul Domer says, obviously, Orthodox Russians disliked the Greek Catholics because of their loyalty to Rome. But did Austrian Roman Catholics distrust them because of their Eastern ways? Um, yes, uh, although not so much on religious grounds, um, but much more on linguistic grounds. The Austro-Hungarian army also perpetrates its own mini, uh, I mean, not even so mini, its persecutions and perhaps mini cleansings of the Ukrainian speaking population. Uh, some of the population, so Ukrainian at this time is a political label. Um, the, the, the Habsburg regime refers to the people who speak Ukrainian in this region as Ruthenes or Ruthenians. And um, if these people, if Ruthenians call themselves Ukrainians, then that is a national mark which, which indicates that they don't perceive themselves to belong to Russia. They are, they are a Ukrainian people, their own nation. But while most people by 1914 have that um, embrace that identity, not all do. There's a group of so-called um, old uh, um, old Ruthenians who uh, who embrace a Russian cultural identity and in some cases a Russian political identity. And the Habsburg army is very very paranoid and um, at the outset of the First World War, it also uses Ruthenes to uh, as scapegoats for its own incompetence and for its own defeats. And as a result, there are persecutions and executions of Ruthenes both during the great uh, during the retreat of 1914, and the garrison of Przemysl also carries them out. Uh, there's a shocking order in which um, uh, a medium middle-ranking commander says um, orders his men that even if Ruthenes aren't in in the surrounding region in, in the no man's land aren't doing anything, they should be executed on site, Ruthenian civilians. So, so yes, that, that's, there, there certainly is suspicion and persecution but on linguistic grounds, on the fact that Ukrainian to, to German speakers sounds a bit like Russian. Thank you. Uh, Pamela Myers asks a simple direct question, population re-engineering, is that a new term in uh, this period? Oh, I don't know that, well, so it's not, a, it's only not a contemporary term. No, it's not a contemporary term. Um, talk of useless eaters and cleansing regions, Zauberung, does come about in this, in this, at this time in 1914, 1915, for sure. Although it's not used as extensively as uh, it is in the 1930s or 1940s. The language, just as the language of total war is developing, the, the term total war, guerre integrale, is coined in 1917 in French. Just as the language of total war is developing, so too the language of ethnic cleansing is developing during the First World War as well, and then comes to fruition in the second. Uh, Joy Kestenbaum asks, can you clarify what would have been considered the Chemishla, I'm trying to pronounce that correctly, the Chemishla district or general area? Uh, I had a Jewish family, great grandparents and great aunt living in a small town just about 10 miles due west of Chemishla along the main east-west road. I've visited Chemishla and I've heard from my father that World War I was devastating, but I don't know how it directly impacted my family other than that they survived the war. So what is to reiterate, what's her, how do you define the district or general area? So the Habsburg Empire was divided into so-called crownlands, another term, that that was the Habsburg term for them. Um, we might call them provinces, uh, like Galicia, and then, and then those provinces were divided into small administrative units, districts, or, or Bezirke in German, each of which had a Bezirkshauptmann, a, a kind of a district captain who was um, the main administrator. Um, and there was, a city of Przemysl, but there was also one of the districts was called District of Przemysl. If you go on Wikipedia, um, then I think on from memory on the English version, there is a there is a map with all the different districts coloured in, so you can see the the uh, and that's a pretty accurate map. So you can see the you can see the uh, the the um, district of, of of the city in 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 there. And if you drop me an email, my my um, email is 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 online i can i can take a photograph and, and send you a map of the devastation that was um carried out in these different districts and um it's particularly awful in 
in the Plemish, Plemish district, not just because of the Russians, but also because the Austro-Hungarian garrison cleared the villages in order to um, make clear fields of fire for the forts. Thanks. Uh, Harvey Glasner has two questions, which I'm going to be uh, combining into one. He wants to know, would the world, what would the world be like if the Austro-Hungarian Empire had won, and would the Jews have been better off? Uh, under the Habsburgs than under the Russians, which is a, a tough question. Uh, and it is a tough question, isn't it? Um, it's a counterfactual one, but it's a fair question. So I think it depends under what circumstances the Habsburg Empire had won. By 1918, if the war had ended in 1918, the Germans had been successful in defeating the Allies on the uh, Western Front, then um, uh, the Habsburg Empire would have been a uh, satellite state. It would have had rather limited autonomy. And for Jews, yeah, it's difficult to imagine they would have been exterminated. I mean, the thing about, in some ways, it's a very easy question to answer because given what happened to the Jewish population of East Central Europe in the 30s and 40s, almost any scenario, it's difficult to imagine a worse scenario. So the answer is yes, um, for them, it would have been better off. It probably would have been better off for Ukrainians as well, who suffered um, further Easter starvation famine uh, uh, under, under Stalin in the early 1930s. Um, whether Europe and the world would have been better off with a central powers victory, that's debatable. That's, that's, a much, that's, that's a much more difficult question to answer. Yeah, there's been a lot of debate about that, and I'm sure you're familiar with the Fritz Fischer uh, controversy, um, uh, particularly on German war aims. That would take another seminar. Maybe we'll bring you back for, for that. Uh, I want to answer a couple of questions from Facebook. You visited Chemischla, right? Have you been there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and one of our uh, questions is, can you see scars of the siege today from the city? You can see the remains of the fortifications, and they're really, really powerful. Um, if you if you take a look at if you take a look at my book, um, can I show you my book? Is that all right? Would that be? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Put my book. Okay. Absolutely. That's my book. Yes. Uh, the writing, the writing on uh, in the real thing is the right way around, but that's my book. If you take a look at this, it it, it ends with um, it ends with what you can see today. The, the book starts off with imagining what it would have been like. I, I use tourist guides, what, what Shemish would have been like in 1914. And then it takes the reader back to what it's like today and how, how that past seems graspable. And yet there are key changes and key differences. And it ends in the ruins of the fortress and the ruins of, of, of the fortress of, of the old defences are really, really impressive. And for me, the rubble kind of is a really powerful memorial, not just of the siege and the suffering of that, but also of of, 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 of the course of events that, that mm. that violence in 1914 began. Mm. I would love to see it myself. Uh, once, <laughs> uh, once we're able to travel again, that, that would be nice. I recommend that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Walter on Facebook asks if you could comment on Colonel Reddell's effect on the early defeats for the Austro-Hungarian army or was it inept generalship? Uh, it was meant, it was inept generalship. So, so Colonel Reddell was, um, uh, and uh, a general staff officer who'd been uh, heavily involved in intelligence before the First World War. Um, he was homosexual and he was bribed by the uh, he was bribed by the Imperial Russians who had a very, very effective spy network in Austria-Hungary to give um, uh, to give uh, all sorts of crucial military documentation, including the Habsburg general mobilization plan and indeed also the plans for the fortress of Przemysla. So it was certainly, his, his espionage was, um, was certainly damaging. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you can't really let the, 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 the Habsburg command off simply by, by, by saying, well, you know, uh, because they knew about, they, uh, the Habsburg commander, Konrad von Hutzendorf, he knew about this, Vedel was discovered before the First World War, and the mobilization plans were changed. They were altered um, in order to account for that espionage and try and, and, try and get around it. Um, so no, uh, the cat-handedness, although Vedel doesn't help, the cat-handedness is, is all down to the Habsburg leadership in, in 1914. This is, this, is, this is their pile of something to, to sit in. As you show very well in your book, uh, Conrad von Hutzendorf is one of the most fascinating villains uh, and just a disaster of a human being in so many ways, both as a, as a general and, and in his role in, uh, in fomenting the war. Um, I'm going to try to get to a few more. We have so many great questions here, so we'll go, go another five minutes since I want to get to some of these. Um, 
Uh, let's see, Ron Birnbaum, uh, he says, I know very little about my grandfather, but I, I know the following facts. He was a Jew from Chemishla, as were his forebears. He served in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in World War I, and he emigrated to Argentina in 1930. How might you imagine these events playing out in a decision to emigrate then? So this is, this is a great question, and it, it kind of gets to the heart of the problem of a lot of the historiography on the Second World War and the Holocaust. Because if you start only in 1930, or even with the end of the Second World War, you don't recognize that a lot of the, the, the Jews in this region, middle-aged Jews, had already been through one extraordinarily violent persecution, which then must have had an impact on how they viewed the Nazi regime and, and, and what was coming. The difficulty to know, because there isn't yet enough research about it, is, is actually what that prompted them to do. Did it prompt them to fear the Nazis um, because they'd already been through uh, they'd already been through an occupation by an, a, a virulently anti-Semitic uh, Imperial Russian occupier 20 years before? And there is evidence that it did, because one of the things that we find in Przemysla is that Jews flee eastwards. In fact, it's right through Poland. Jews flee, flee eastwards. Um, into the Soviet, uh, into the Soviet controlled zone, because the Soviets are perceived uh, rightly, although they're bloody in all sorts of other ways, as, uh, as, as less anti-Semitic than the Nazis. Um, on the other hand, the fact that the First World War is about, brings cleansing, but doesn't actually bring genocide, means that perhaps that experience of 1914-15 is misleading because it's difficult for Jews to imagine having been through what the Imperial Russians did and being forced out of the city, but not actually murdered um, in a genocide. It, it's, it's difficult to take that imaginative leap and believe that the Nazis are, are, are going to execute a genocide. Um, so, the jury, so the jury is out on that. And this is the problem with the historiography. We need to link these areas much more tightly. And my book, The Fortress, is, um, is an attempt to begin that process. It's a great question. Thank you. And then here's an interesting uh, one, too, from uh, Joy Kessenbaum. She says, some Jewish history scholars have been studying the impact of the Russian Civil War and the pogroms just following World War I as precursors to the genocide of World War II. I'm thinking, for example, of um, Alyssa uh, Bemparad's book, Legacy of Blood, Jews, Pogroms, and Ritual Murder um, in the Lands of the Soviets. Uh, do you have any comments on that? So this is this is this is a huge step forward, but I think the problem that I have still with that is that it still sees the violence of the 30s and 40s in the context of the revolutionary ideologies that came out of 1917 and the end of the First World War in 1914. And what it doesn't recognise, and it, you know, don't get me wrong, I mean, it's 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 great work, and it's uh, it, it's great that people are doing that this and, and focusing on this early period, but it still doesn't recognize that we already have extraordinary violence and ethnic cleansing um, before the Russian Revolution, before the um, uh, advent of Bolshevism, or the taking of power of Bolshevism and, and, and fascism. Um, we have it already in 1914. This is a feature of imperial powers. And that's, that I think that part of the story needs to be factored in as well. That would be my response. Let's try to fit in two more questions. And uh, first of all, I'm going to combine two questions into one from Sherry Babish and from Tom Moriarty, um, who both want to know more about Russian views of Ukraine. Uh, Sherry says uh, they considered Ukraine primordial Russia. Uh, and uh, Tom Moriarty says, I never knew this view the Russians had of Ukrainians. It explains a lot about the events going on today. Um, did, and Sherry asked, did Russia consider other regions the same way? Yes, so the major focus is on, uh, the, the, the Russians' major focus is on, is on eastern Galicia, so the eastern half of that province. There are, in 1914, there's some suggestion that there are, uh, there's a desire to occupy parts of um, what was then Germany, what then at the end of the Second World War becomes Kaliningrad. Um, if you take a look at that, there's a, there's a Russian enclave just to the north of Poland. Um, but the major focus of the, both the regime's uh, imperial leaders, the emperor and his advisors, and also his military leaders was Eastern Galicia, precisely because of the existence of Ukrainians there, or Ukrainian speakers there. Now, the, the histories of the Ukrainian and Russian 
uh, nations um, and states um, go back together. They join both 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 modern states trace their origins to Kievan Rus uh, back in the early Middle Ages. So this is where this is where the Russian state looks back to, and this is where uh, the Ukraine state looks back to. And of course, for much of uh, the history of what is now Ukraine, a significant part of that was under Russian control. Um, and what we find in the late 19th century, when nationalism, nationalism is on the rise right across Europe, is that Ukrainian regions, and especially Ukrainian regions in, in the Ukrainian populated part of the Habsburg Empire, nationalism rises there too, and ideas, and there's a real ideological battle among Ukrainians because of who are we? Are we Ukrainian? Are we a Ukrainian nation? Are we a separate nation? Or are we actually a branch of the Russian nation? Um, the Russians, the Imperial Russians, that is, are never in any doubt about this. Of course, they're a branch of the, Imper uh, of the Russian nation. They are little Russians, that's the term. Just like Belarusian, Russia, it means white Russian. Um, so the Russian leadership sees these, these groups with different uh, languages. Um, they see the languages as different dialects of Russian, and they see these groups as different branches of the greater Russian family tree. And it's for that reason that Eastern Galicia is particularly focused on. So let's finish up with a more military question from Edward Smart, who asked if the city had fallen in October of 1914, what impact do you think that would have had on the Austro-Hungarian Empire? I think it would have broken it. Um, I think it would have broken it precisely because, uh, because the Habsburg army was in so much disarray. The fact that it had lost a third of its combat troops was in itself not such it sounds, it sounds very callous to say so, but this is certainly how Conrad viewed it. It wasn't such a huge problem. At this point, early point in the war, there was plenty of cannon fodder. They could, they could, they could, replace, they could replace the soldiers. A bigger problem was that they'd lost half of their trained officers. And bear in mind that this is a multi-ethnic army. So the officers are not only people, the professional officers are not only people who know, who have military know-how, tactical know-how, but they're also often people who can communicate with troops, whereas reserve officers can't because professional officers were under the obligation of being able to speak the languages of their soldiers. Um, and, you know, there may be two, three, four languages in a regiment which officers were expected to, uh, to speak. So the loss of these officers meant both a, a loss of tactical know-how, um, or be it rather ineffective tactical know-how, but also it really broke the cohesion of these units because the new officers often couldn't communicate with their soldiers. On top of that, there was massive demoralization among the men, there was huge indiscipline, um, and, and the result of this was that the army had to get back. I mean, the fact that it, it, that it retreats uh, 80 miles in this, in this period from Chemish, yeah, so um, uh, you know, indicates just how far away it needed to get from the enemy in order to get that key, crucial time to restore order. Above all, restore order and recuperate and give the troops some, wear, some rest. If Pshemish hadn't been there, or if it had fallen very quickly, then the Russians would potentially have had use of the railroads and 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 uh, the main highways across Pshemish, and they would have been uh, sorry across Galicia, and they would have been able to move east west far far quicker. The person in charge of um, the the sea, the first siege of Pshemish, the the, the storm Pshemish, uh, in charge of the army groups uh, which which took that on, was actually Brusilov. Um, uh, who is, becomes famous later in the war for the Brussels Offensive. He's perceived as one of the most effective Russian generals of the war, in part because there aren't that many Russian sources around, uh, translated into English. One of them is Brusilov's memoirs. Um, and of course he said, I was great, I was brilliant. No one was like me. Um, look at 1916, but 1914, 1914, Brusilov, um, perceives Shemish to be the key to, um, to, to launching an invasion of Central Europe. Um, and uh, it's he who orders the attack, and it's a huge failure, which he kind of passes over quite quickly in his memoirs. Um, but it's a huge failure, not just because the Russians don't get in, but it's a huge failure because it's a potentially war-winning situation um, in which the Russians fail to capitalize on. And yeah, I think the, the fortress's resistance is utterly key in giving that, um, in giving that crucial breathing space for, to allow the Habsburg army to come up and, for that, and to allow the Habsburg empire to continue this war right to the bitter end in 1918. Very good. Well, as I told you, Alex, before we began this, we do have a very intelligent audience. And that was certainly reflected in the questions that we've got. And I do apologize for you, those of you in the audience that we didn't have time to get to your questions. 
again, these are some of the best questions I've seen. Uh, but it's a reflection of, of the topic uh, in your book and a great presentation. Again, I highly recommend The Fortress. It's one of the best books that I've read, and I've read a lot on World War I. Uh, but I think all of you who are interested in World War II, you need to read this book. Uh, and Alex, we hope to get you over here to the United States when things clear up. We were going to have you speaking in November, but uh, we're going to get you uh, in the spring, I would hope. Uh, so yes. thank you again. That would be lovely. And I'm, I'm, I want to say I'm, I'm really grateful to having this opportunity to, to, to do this webinar with you. It's been a huge privilege. And, and to, the, to the audience, as, as, as well as to the National World War II Museum, thank you so much for your question. Thank you for being engaged. And thank you for taking the time to come and listen. Thank you very, very much. I've hugely enjoyed it. Brilliant. Take care. Okay.